Hi there, this is Empowerment Hour. I'm Denise Oliver and my guest today is Ben Calder. And Ben, that was a choice of yours. <laughs> I've just said I'd never heard of them. So that was Pearl Jam. That was Pearl Jam. That, that's surprised. I mean, you know, we, we were saying uh, as we were listening there, surprised you haven't heard of them because they are such a big band. And for, the, for those of us who are, are into that kind of early 90s American grunge genre they are like one of the iconic bands and I got to see them again last year and you know they're still incredible musicians I love it cool so let's start at the very beginning which is a line from a song I always love um so where were you born let's just really really get to know Ben Calder so uh, now I've been a bit of a traveller in, in, in the early years, as it were, but I was born in Margate in, in Kent. Uh, and I'm never really sure if that makes me a Kentish man or a man of Kent. Okay. Uh, apparently it has to do with which side of a particular river you're born on, but I've never worked it out. So if anybody knows, let us know, because, uh, you know, it would clear up that question yeah, for me. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I didn't really stay in Kent uh, very long because... Uh, my father and then subsequently my stepfather were both in the RAF. So every couple of years we were moving and I did a couple of years living up in, in Forres in Scotland, uh, uh, being really close to Findhorn and that was my kind of first exposure to, to kind of Findhorn as an area. Uh, and then we were in County Durham and North Yorkshire and then we were down in Cornwall which is where I did the, from, from kind of age uh, seven up to 19 uh, where I did the majority of my uh, growing up down there. So whereabouts in Cornwall? I love uh, Cornwall. Yeah, so it's Newquay, uh, or St. Colin Minor, actually, if you want to be kind of technical <laughs> about not being a Newquay. Uh, but we were we were in Newquay on the north coast, and, and mm. my mum still lives down there now, uh, and, and it's where I'll be spending sort of uh, after Christmas and through to New Year as well. Uh, but a beautiful place to grow up, mm. and uh, being able to just spend so much time out by the sea and on the cliffs, and we were literally five minutes' walk from the beach where we lived, and, you know, it was an amazing place to grow up. Did you surf? Uh, I did, yes. Uh, and, you know, by the time I left at 19, I had kind of like chest length, long blonde hair <laughs> and, uh, and and was that kind of quintessential sort of, sur- you know, little goatee beard. And <laughs> surfer dude, yeah. That didn't last long though, <laughs> university, and it all got shaved off and uh, changed to style. But, yeah, very, very kind okay. of typical upbringing there. So from Cornwall, where did you go? Which uh, uni? It was uni in Cheltenham. Uh, so so that was great. That was a uh, uh, four-year honours degree, uh, getting a Bachelor of Education. Uh, and some, I don't know how I passed it. I don't know <laughs> don't know how I made it through four years because uh, I, I wasn't at that stage. I wasn't a very good academic at all. You know, most of my assignments would be done the night before they were due in. And, and I was terrible at getting things done and was definitely better at the social side of, of university than I was at the <laughs> academic. So somehow at the end of four years, they told me I passed and I wiped my brow and it was just like wow you know I've managed to do that but uh, yeah it was it was uh, it was a good place to be it was a beautiful place to be yeah Uh, it's lovely down there my sister's down in Weston but she's lived in Gloucester and all around that area it's beautiful I love it M5 hate it but everything off the M5 is gorgeous Yeah. yeah really nice so you what was the purpose of your university degree for you? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, I mean, when I was in when I was in secondary school, I already had this inkling to want to do what, in my mind, seemed like teaching yeah. uh, at that point, because uh, I had a real thing for wanting to just be with people and helping them to understand stuff and seeing kind of like the light light up in them when they understood and it was like they took another step up the ladder and uh, and even as a teenager I was really aware that that's what I like to do and so uh, I did a bachelor of education in primary uh, teaching so I qualified as a primary school teacher when I finished there and and one of the reasons why I wiped my brow and I, I finished my degree and I knew I'd passed was that I knew I wasn't ready to teach right because as a as a 22 year old lad who who realized at that point I had dyslexia as well the idea of going into a school to teach 11 subjects that I was qualified to go and teach according to to the yeah. university there was no way I was was prepared for that and and I could just see that a it was going to be a bad experience for me and, and b it, it would have been unfair and, and and unuseful on any of the the children I taught they would have had a great time you know they would have loved my Disney ties and all the other kind of crazy <laughs> things I did to compensate for the fact that my my academia was was lacking but uh, I can't believe that because to me you're the walking encyclopedia There's, I can ask you a question on almost anything <laughs> and you can answer me 
So, sure. so what was going on for you at that point if you didn't think uh, you were academic? Well, well, part of it was, was down to the fact that, uh, I mean, obviously for a primary school teacher especially, you're teaching a lot of writing. Okay. And uh, if you ever look at me write, it, it's like a doctor got drunk and <laughs> fell on a prescription pad with a pen in their armpit. You know, it's it's not real writing. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, re- you know, I would reverse letters and I had real problems with spelling and there was a lot of stuff that, and again, thanks to kinesiology and a bunch of other things, is is so so much better than it was uh, when I was that age. But I, I just knew it was going to be a mistake. Right. So I, uh, and, and you know, when I spoke to the college uh, kind of support and said, well, what else can I do? Oh, well, you can either go into personnel or not much else really. <laughs> and I was I was okay. kind of like. Ooh, no, I don't want to do the teaching, don't want to do the personnel. What, what well, am I going to do? Well, don't tell us. Huh? So, Ben, you've left uni and you're not a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am a teacher, but I'm just not <laughs> going to go teaching. and teach. You're yeah. not doing it. Sure. There, there was no way I was going to go into a, a school and uh, and ruin the lives of young people. with. Uh, <laughs> I with think they've had ideas. great fun with you, actually. Yeah, they, they would have. They wouldn't have learned anything useful for exams, <laughs> but, you know, they'd have learned to enjoy life in a different I way. I can imagine. Sure. You must have watched School of Rock with Jack Black. Oh, yeah. I can imagine you'd have been like that. Yeah, that, that, that's closer to the kind of teacher, just not quite so talented on a guitar, but, uh, you know, def- definitely along those lines. But it, it was funny, I like, I really didn't know what I was going to do then, and... Uh, um, I at the time uh, the the job I had towards the end of university was working in an outdoor activity shop uh, and so I, I was doing a lot of climbing and a, and a lot of uh, kind of hill walking and outdoor stuff at the time and so I decided because it's, it's a place with great climbing in the UK I moved down to Weymouth uh, so that could be right next to Portland uh, and all of the the beautiful limestone climbing that's on Portland and really good places like Swanage just up the coast and it wasn't all that far away from um, from Dartmoor as well and all yeah. the nice granite there and I thought I don't know what to do I'm just going to go and climb for a year and, and go and find out you know what's going on and uh, and while I was down in Weymouth I mean you know like I rocked up no job no money you know it was it was a proper student desperation place uh, and I ended up getting a job working for uh, for New Look the clothing company <laughs> uh, in their distribution factory uh, which was in Weymouth because they used to have a lot of stuff come in from over overseas uh, there and uh, I would do night shifts from from 10 p.m. until 6 a.m. and I would basically count clothes into bins and count them out of bins and you know do stock checking and stuff and it was a horrible job <laughs> you know it, it was rancid but uh, it, it paid you know reasonably well and it meant that I could sleep from kind of like 6 30 until uh, about lunchtime uh, and then I would get up and I'd go climbing and uh, go out and enjoy the rock and then I, I'd come back kind of as the sun was getting down have some food and go to work and um that's what I started to do uh and while I was there I uh I met a, a guy uh called Ron who he ran the Weymouth uh like a youth project at the time and uh, I didn't know this when I walked in, but Ron was a massive advocate of NLP. Okay. And, and he was very good at it as well. And uh, I sat down and I was like, you know, I trained as a teacher and, and, and I kind of, I climb and uh, and, I, and I would like to volunteer to do something useful because I like working with young people. Uh, you know, what do you think? And he said, what do you like to do? What would you like to do here? How would you like to be able to help? <laughs> and I was just like, uh, I, I don't know. What can I do? And he said, I don't know what what can you do? And, you know, I didn't God realize. Answer I was, me the question with a question. Sure. And I didn't realize I was being kind of like encouraged to basically find a way that I could come in and, and support the youth group. And uh, and I did. And, and for about a year, I, I went along and, uh, and did support work with the young people there around some of their music projects and some of the outdoor stuff they did. Uh, and during that time, uh, Ron, who, who was an absolute superstar, uh, talked. Uh, you know, with NLP in brackets, uh, Dorchester County Council into paying for 20 of us volunteers uh, to have a full residential NLP practitioner program that we did over nine months. Wow. So once a month, we'd go away for a whole weekend immersion uh, to do our NLP practitioners diplomas. And uh, and, and that was just... Just explain know. what 
what NLP is for them yeah, who sure. don't Yeah, sure. It's uh, neuro-linguistic programming is, is what the letters stand for. Uh, and at a basic level, it's communications modeling. So it's, it's looking at the way that people communicate and looking at ways for being able to communicate more easily with them and also to help them to make uh, both subtle and, and more overt changes in their own language and their own thinking processes mm. so that they are able to do things more constructively uh, and look at the ways that they limit themselves and look at kind of thought patterns and beliefs of how they limit themselves and get them to think about those differently. So, uh, yeah, so Ron got us on to, to this uh, amazing course uh, with a, a guy called Reg Connolly uh, from Phoenix Empowerment. And Reg had ch- uh, trained with um, uh, Bandler and Grindler and, and uh, you know, kind of been in yeah. with the kind of the NLP pioneers yeah. uh, and, and had been in a, a really kind of privileged place. And he was a cheeky little Irish man that he would, we were in, we were literally in an outdoor uh, centre in the middle of the new forest doing this high ropes courses and and all these crazy things to do and we'd go out on night hikes and things and he'd set us all these crazy tasks leave us to just chaos into them and then afterwards he'd come up in this little irish accent and go so ben why do you think he did that like that (laughs) and before you know it your head's just like exploding as it's like i got no idea reg do you want to have a little think about that and just wonder what might be going on in there for you? And he would he would become more Irish when he was <laughs> going to NLP you and his accent would increase. And we all, we all used to laugh about this. But it was just funny watching him kind of open us up and, and move us around and and seeing that in the in the high rope settings and in the climbing settings uh, started to inspire me and and from there I went on and, and got a job uh, in Weymouth in an outdoor activity center uh, doing high ropes and climbing and abseiling with with kind of children between uh, eight and eighteen and uh, and that that was a phenomenal period of about seven eight months where uh, every day all day I was just talking people into doing things that they they couldn't believe they could do so by, by using the NLP yeah yeah uh, did they realize that's what you were doing I mean hardly anybody had heard of NLP at that yeah. point uh, but you know that there, there was some there was some just amazing achievements with these people that you know they'd be standing on a uh, like a high balance beam that's 40 50 feet off the ground uh, and standing at one end clutching a pole going I can't do this I can't do this and in a couple of minutes they're running back and forth on it and it's just because you wow. can <laughs> look at what it is that you know because everybody's tied in everybody's safe there is no danger yeah so what is it that stops you and if that wasn't there, you know, how would you do it differently? And what is possible? And, you know, we used to get kids cartwheeling on these things and hanging off them by their, their heels and, you know, just doing stuff that when they came down to the ground, you could see this kind of like light, this opening in their eyes that just made them so excited. You know, they felt so and alive. Confident. Yeah. yeah. And, and they, they'd have these beautiful weeks with us and do all this outdoor crazy stuff. And, you know, some of them had, had only ever been brought up in cities so um, and we were literally right on the edge of the ocean at Osmington Bay and uh, no one had ever you know they hadn't seen this place before and so there we were bang open your minds open your realities and and then you know see you at the end of the week next (laughs) come on in and you know yeah, yeah, so cool. I spent I spent kind of quite a while doing that. So Ben, we've been climbing walls with you. <laughs> yes, yeah. So and and yeah, cl- climbing the walls. Climbing was really something that at that point in my life. Uh, the outdoor activity centre, great fun, but as a as a career prospect, okay. you know, the, there's a limit to it. And uh, I had a secondment up to Press Statin of all places because the company I worked for, they also provided all of the outdoor staff for pontins and for the climbing towers and the um, the zip wires that they had. And so I got a two week break in pontins up in Press Statin. Nice. Uh, it Ish. was interesting. <laughs> It was pressed at in and real. I mean, you know, uh, went um, there year on year when I was a child. That's where we went for our holidays. Yeah, I have very fond memories of it. Yeah, 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 and and it was you know it was good fun, but it, it kind of uh, at the same time there was a job opportunity that opened up in Ludlow to go and work for a care company that looked after uh, eleven to sixteen year old uh, people who 
had been removed from home because of abuse or neglect. So they were young people in in, in very difficult situations, uh, a lot of them very traumatized, and they did a lot of outdoor pursuits with them. And uh, to me, a, a, an, an interesting progression from the, the lovely uh, cliffs of, of Portland and, and Swanage was to look at moving into doing stuff in North Wales. And there was a lot of climbing available uh, in Snowdonia. And, you know, it seemed like you know, a short uh, hop away. Uh, and so I got a job there and moved to Shrewsbury, uh, which is over 16 years ago now. And, and started working in this, this job, uh, which turned out not to be anything like they advertised. Uh, so <laughs> surprise, I, surprise. I did no outdoor uh, <laughs> pursuits work. Uh, and uh, I was basically in this residential home, uh, essentially policing young people who were borderline on a last stop before Borstal or some other more serious, secure situation. And, and it was incredibly difficult work, difficult shifts, you know, kind of two days on, uh, like it was a 48 hour shift, basically. Yeah. Uh, and if you got sleep, you were lucky. Uh, and, you know, it, it was just it was strong you had to do a lot a lot of physical work with the kids uh, I spent a lot of time restraining young people who were having violent episodes uh, I spent a lot of time going to police stations to pick up children that had absconded from the home nicked cars burnt them out somewhere and then been arrested uh, so I you know it was it was a difficult job and and, and in how the end old were you then? Uh, so what would I have been I would have been 24 five maybe 24 25 yeah so that's tough it it was really tough yeah uh it got to a point where as i used to drive up the the road that led up to where the building was i used to start to feel sick yeah uh, because literally you could pull into the car park and there would just be kids and staff and chaos everywhere and the 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 staff who were about to finish their shift just couldn't wait for you to arrive and literally you're in the building they did a change over and they were gone and you were left with the aftermath and and sometimes that meant another two days of chaos uh, but it was exhausting and yeah. uh, uh, I didn't want to do that. Um, and that that's about the same time that, that I actually, uh, because one of the other kind of little bits of my life that, that is, is quite significant is that uh, when I was 15, uh, my mum and I used to go to uh, a friend of hers who lived just a little bit up the street uh, and they did psychic development classes. And uh, so at 15, mum and I used to go along once a month and uh, I learned how to uh, kind of read energy a little bit and, and do a bit of psychometry and start to feel uh, kind of healing energies and stuff like that. And the lady who ran those uh, events, uh, Carolyn Bowyer, used used to or or then started doing the Cornwall New Age exhibition which for about 10 years or more became this massive three-day event every November Um, because we were friends we used to help her with the setup and then during the exhibition itself we would uh, you know kind of like get stuff for stall holders and talk uh, the the talk hosts and and then when the talks were going on we used to collect the tickets at the doors and then once the talk started the door had to be sealed so that nobody could come in late because there were demonstrations of mediumship and there were uh, kind of meditations and other stuff that went on and and we had the choice of either sitting outside and sealing the door or we could sit inside and we could listen to the talk and seal the door so I always used to sit in and so from from kind of age 15 I used to go in and and I'd spend three days a year solidly just listening to people talking about different forms of holistic therapy Uh, and I met some of the most influential people in my life uh, in those places Sue and Simon Lilly uh, who are now based in Powys who I I still kind of work with their stuff um, uh, amongst others and and, uh, you know, so I used to do do a lot of that. And, uh, you know, I'd moved up to Shrewsbury. I'd had this this really challenging job and, and I'd gone home to go and help at one of the exhibitions in November. I needed a break and I thought, great, three days of, of hippie new age stuff would be perfect. Um, <laughs> So I went home and uh, and Sue Lilly uh, at that point did a, a lecture called Hacking Your Body's Computer uh, and I was on the door for it and I thought, oh, I'll sit and listen to this, he's good. Uh, and she spent uh, 90 minutes talking about kinesiology and at the oh, end okay. of it, you know, I had my jaw was on the floor like... 
wow, this sounds too good to be true. And so I went up to the stand that her and Simon had afterwards and I said, look, I've, I've got these issues going on right now. I've got allergic rhinitis. I've got psoriasis. You know, I'm, I'm not in a good place. Do you think this could help? And she said, sit down and let's find out. <laughs> uh, and, and that was it. And she just started muscle testing me right there at the stand. Yeah. And, uh, and and that became kind of like a, like a really defining moment for me back in, that was 1999. Uh, and, and that was a, a really kind of powerful for moment and uh, and started to shape change uh, and and within a, a couple of months of, of that moment I started seeing a kinesiologist in Shrewsbury uh, a lady called Frankie Cossey uh, who still practices down in London now and uh, and I, f- I quit the job and and I went on to another oh, job goodness. yeah absolutely yeah. went to another care job though still working with young people because I still thought that that was where my talents uh, lie uh, but this was with children with autism and Down syndrome uh, who had extreme behaviour mm. and so we're in a, a residential schooling unit um, which also turned out to be an incredibly challenging job and I was still spending a lot of time restraining children having violent episodes and administering drugs and you know uh, taking autistic kids on outings that they didn't want to go out on uh, you know they were quite happy self-stimulating and being in their own spaces but there was something about the nature of, of society that to be doing a good job it job it had to look like we were taking people out and right. doing yeah, normal doing, things with yeah. them you know and the, the kids were much happier running around in the in the gardens that they had there and, yeah. and doing their own thing yeah um I think we things have changed though, haven't they? Over I hope time. so. Yeah. yeah, I mean that that's that's with you know looking back two thousand two thousand and one. Yeah. So this is a long way back. Yeah. Um. So I really do hope things have changed that way. Yeah. Uh, and it and it was during that that. Uh, the kinesiology work I've been having, I got to a point where I was kind of bored of uh, uh, not understanding what Frankie was doing with me in the kinesiology sessions. And, and for me, her explanations just weren't meaty enough and so I put myself on a training course thought um, yeah I'm not really happy with the job I'm doing this looks cool sitting around (laughs) wiggling people's arms I know I feel better for having had it so it's now time to to look at something else so we're in the final segment of this show so Ben you've had you're having your kinesiology where are we going from there yeah, so it was it, it was a, a fairly easy decision in some ways to decide to go and train in kinesiology. Uh, I, I liked what it was doing. Mm. The logic of it made a lot of sense to me. Uh, and again, kind of coming back from that, that dyslexic writer kind of side of things, for me, the way that kinesiology is, is organized is just like flow diagrams. Do we do this or this? And, and it's one way or the other. And, and for anybody that hasn't come across kinesiology, this is where we're using manual muscle testing to get the nervous system and therefore the, the body as an organism to respond to an idea. And either the stability from the idea or there's debility. So we're looking basically at a yes, no kind of pathway. Should I do this? Yes, no. Is it better if I do this? Yes, no. Is this beneficial for me? Yes, no. And so that logic sequence seemed very obvious to me and and, and very natural to me and so I decided to go and start training uh, it would have been the the kind of October of 2001 uh, when I I started training I think uh, or September 2001 uh, with Anne Parker who at the time was the the head of uh, health kinesiology UK Uh, she's now retired and and back home in a native Australia and uh, she was a, a, a very great-spirited Australian lady who was in her early 60s at that time. And uh, she'd been known when she was a teacher in Canada uh, in school, she'd been known as Sergeant Parker uh, <laughs> because it was, right, come on, we hit, yep. Uh, and so there was this structure that she gave into that kinesiology training that was really clear. And, in, and it just seemed in a lot of ways like she was speaking to me in the room because everything she said just I got it it made sense yeah and when we went on to do the practicals when I was you know there, there was a group of about 20 of us or so uh, on that first training course and there's people looking around uh, and scrabbling with notes and trying to work out what they're doing next I just knew what I had to do it was you know I hardly had to look at the instructions I just knew and and it made such sense to me and it just there was this real natural aptitude for kinesiology and and I just you know kind of went with it and 
uh, and carried on. I really dedicated myself to it. And after I'd done the the third level of, of training with it, I quit my job uh, and I uh, uh, spent my weekends working for uh, Elegance Natural Skin Care, who are a, a Welsh-based uh, natural skincare company. Uh, and I would go out I to... I didn't know that. <laughs> I, I, would, I would go out to craft fairs with like a car full of their stuff and, and I'd set up a, a stand and, and I'd spend my weekends just at craft fairs and fates and everything like that selling skincare products to to barely cover my uh, my costs and my mm. my rent and stuff uh, and then through the week i was just studying and practicing kinesiology uh, so that by the time i came through to uh, the end of my training uh, in 2003 uh, no sorry in 2002 and then my assessment in 2003 i, I hit the floor running and uh, you know I, I was after my training i'd gone into a, a local health center in shrewsbury and said look i'm not even qualified yet but i'm really good so you know can i good just can i just start working yeah. and i'll make it clear to everybody that i'm still a student and that i can't charge them and it's just for donations uh and and then in uh the end of january 2003 i qualified officially and i, I still had uh, about 18 months two years worth of uh, additional work to get me up to full professional uh, to kinesiology federation registered professional which was uh, kind of the level I was aiming for and uh, but within six months of starting I had uh, a three day a week virtually full time practice and uh, and that was it that was all I did uh, I spent a couple of months in the interim working in, in millets as an outdoor shop <laughs> uh, just to help you know again just that little bit of subsidy in, in the income um and and after a couple of months i realized that the three part-time days i did in millets i could make the same money in about four hours doing kinesiology so i kind of did a a big prayer and just went right get me four more a week so right, i can universe, stop doing yeah, this yeah. and then i can put more time and effort into into helping and supporting people which is what i love doing yeah. and really enjoy doing uh, and within two weeks i was at the level i wanted so i quit millets and uh and began my career as a uh, uh, as kinesiologist and uh, and so much more which we're going to come on to next we time we will do we? yeah because sure. you've done so many so much more training as well since yeah. then so it's kinesiology is like your baseline i think very at the much moment, isn't it yeah. um so how can people find out more from a website what's your website called ben bencolder.co.uk it, it's so <laughs> straightforward yeah that, yeah sure absolutely <laughs> i didn't want anything complicated and it needed to be obvious who it was about so yeah, and there's all sorts of free resources and you can access my blog, which has got a lot of the old radio stuff on there as well that you and I have done. Yeah. Uh, so there's lots of uh, great and interesting stuff in there uh, and insights into a lot of other bits and bobs that I do if you want to jump ahead of next week. <laughs> if you want to find out more or indeed if somebody wants an appointment with you. So you're not just in Shrewsbury, you go to Chester as well, don't That's you? That's right, yeah. So where are you in Chester? I'm at the Chester Wellness Centre, which is on the uh, the business park here at the uh, the Rexmend of, of Chester. Yeah. Uh, and I'm there on on Thursdays so uh, you'll be going there after today's I will show. be there after yeah so you can you can just call the centre there and book an appointment with me and, and they'll stick you in for one of the fabulous things I do lovely so Ben I'm really looking forward to you coming back next week I'm so glad I'm getting to know you better Thank it's you. great um, it's lovely to have your backstory so do stay tuned it's diet health and fitness at the top of the hour and um, I shall see you then bye for now say bye